Patient Wednesday with Scott Heiser. Today we have uh, Dr. Daniel Crosby, my friend who uh, has some great stuff for us on behaviors. This is the time when people blow themselves up, right? You blow up your strategy on times like this, and I'm seeing people do it all over social media. So I thought nobody I'd, I'd rather talk to right now than uh, Dr. Daniel Crosby. So we're going to be taking your questions uh, I'm going to talk about the shows coming out next week while we while we wait for people to get here. Um, and please uh, tell us that you're here. Say hi, because uh, we're just going to hang out for about 45 minutes to an hour. Coming up next Monday, by the way, I love the show today, Doing More With Less and Loving It, a, a talk about frugalism, environmentalism, and, and minimalism all put together. Uh, I think that's fantastic. On Monday, we're going to talk about negotiation. And if you're at home with other people, maybe it's been negotiating over which Netflix thing you watch next, right? But regardless of that, uh, uh, Wharton professor uh, Mori Teherapur joins us on Monday, how to harness the power of connection to negotiate fearlessly. This was a fantastic read. And it's a lot different than, you know, Chris Voss style um, uh, negotiating. If you know who, who he is about not meeting people in the middle, uh, she's got a, she's got a, a, a whole different way of looking at it. And it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So good stuff. Hey, John, uh, glad you're here. And then on Wednesday, Another uh, uh, great guy. When I think of community builders, I think of I think of this guy, uh, Chris Kermitzos, joins us on on Wednesday. And look at how thin this book is. It's, it's a parable. I love these parable books, but it's start ugly. And I know that people have all kinds of business ideas. In fact, I was reading a hilarious tweet this morning about a husband and wife talking about starting a business. And then they started yelling at each other about <laughs> disagreements about how they were going to start the business because, you know, because they have cabin fever. But, but if you've got a business idea, Chris's recommendation right here on the start on, on the, on the front cover, don't, don't wait to start your business, get it, get it moving. And uh, so if you, if you are sitting around at home, if you're lucky enough to be healthy and sitting at home and you've got time on your hands, starting ugly. In fact, if there was one thing that OG and I wish we had done, the show's gone on what, about nine years. I wish we had started a year earlier when we started talking about, about, about doing this. So just, just absolutely crazy guns here, working from home and listening to SB. Do you mean guns right here? Uh, we were talking about that on Wednesday show, right? Uh, a good friend, Kevin's here from, from Mexico, uh, hanging out there. Just, we got Florida in the house. James is here. Hey man, uh, we're about to, we're about James to, to, to welcome Dr. Crosby here in just a second. And John, um, so in just a few minutes, I know Gertrude is sending out, uh, uh Hey, we're live right now thingy, but while, Everybody is uh, on the way. Let's say hello to Dr. Daniel Crosby. Here he comes. What's happening, man? Hey, man. How are you doing? I'm good. I heard, well, you told me a story about, and this is why we don't do this on Zoom. You got you got Zoom bombed? Yep. I got Zoom bombed. I was doing a, a class lecture for a, a college that will remain unnamed. This college shared the link out publicly and... People came on about five minutes in and started saying some really horrible stuff. And the weirdest thing was I had, I had not heard about this phenomenon now. Now it's kind of widespread. Everyone knows about this. And I think Zoom's taking precautions. But it was so un, unsettling, so unnerving to just be talking to these college kids. And, uh, you know, someone jumps on and starts saying terrible stuff and insulting the appearance of, of like going through sort of the panels and insulting everyone's appearance. And like, it was just bad. It was very That's bad. Great. Well, especially now when everybody looks bad, right? I mean, I don't know about you. I'm not wearing pants as we do this. <laughs> no comment. No comment. <laughs> so uh, Travis is awaiting the snow in New York. Uh, uh, you're in Alabama, right? I'm in Atlanta, actually. Yeah, I'm in you're Atlanta. Atlanta. I'm, I'm from Alabama, but I'm, I live in Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no snow for you, but I'm looking at some serious snow coming down right here in Detroit. Which is which is is horrible. John's yeah. in New Mexico. Sixty-five and sunny here, suckers. Hey, enough of that. Easy. 
<laughs> Easy, pal. Uh, uh, Ken listens to podcasts at one and a half times speed. So we got to we gotta talk faster. So we sound like ourselves for Ken. Ken uh, I'm, I'm from Alabama. That's impossible. <laughs> this is... This, this is Daniel on full blast right now. I'm, uh, this is this is me caffeinated. This is <laughs> well. Let's talk about this because the reason we 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 and by the way, thanks for joining us. The reason I wanted to talk to you uh, is because you and I know it's times like this, my friend, that people blow themselves up. Right? They, they they take their investment strategy and the strategy goes out the window, and all of a sudden, it's a bunch of emotional decisions. Yeah, when I when I dug into the research around, you know, how people do and specifically I was looking at the research around whether or not it makes sense to work with a financial advisor. Uh, the research showed that people on average who work with an advisor do better than those who don't. And it really came down to like four or five times in that person's life where that advisor saved them from a catastrophic mistake. So, I mean, for investors, this is our Super Bowl, like in a very real sense, whether or not you reach your financial goals is really gonna come down to just a handful of, of giant crossroads. And we are sitting at one now for sure. Well, and this is also a time, and I remember you saying this in one of our many conversations, that, that, that we are creatures of... If we do things, things get better, right? If I sit on my if I sit on my butt doing nothing, nothing happens. But with investing, it's actually you've explained many times to me, it's it's the opposite. This is the one pursuit in life where it's exactly the opposite of everything else. Yeah, so I coined this term in in The Laws of Wealth, my my second book, and I coined the term Wall Street Bizarro World. So any comic book readers will be familiar with sort of Bizarro Superman, which is sort of the antithesis of Superman. Uh, bizarro world, Wall Street is a sort of bizarro world because none of the rules of everyday life apply, right? If you, uh, in everyday life, if you want to learn more, you read more books. If you want to get stronger, you lift more weights, you run more miles. But in investing, the more you tend to do, the worse your outcomes tend to be. Um, uh, research I've been citing a lot lately comes from a gentleman named Meyer Statman, Dr. Meyer Statman, he researched in 19 different countries uh, how active people were in their portfolios and found that in every single country, uh, the more someone traded, the worse that they did, and that the most active traders underperformed do-nothing traders by 40%. 40 percent. Holy cow. Yeah, 40 percent. You know, compound that over a, a lifetime and you've got some pretty dramatic results. And so it's a it's a weird thing. Because we all have this action action bias is the shrink term for it. We all have this bias to want to do something when the game is on the line. Uh, but it weirdly, uh, weirdly, the thing to do right now is is probably nothing, or at least not much. When 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 you talk about um, about that, the the and I'm trying to to, to, to frame this question. Um, there are some times though when you need to take action, right? I mean, I mean, there should be. I, I would think there must be a few inflection points where, where where action is completely warranted. Have you seen any studies where 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 it's the opposite of what you're talking about? Where yes, we should have moved, but we didn't. Well, I mean, of of course, post hoc, you can you can see that, like the Monday morning quarterback. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's no question whether. You know, if 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 you could pick the best performing stock of the day every day, you'd make billions of dollars a year. But you, your ability to know that before it happens is pretty limited. And the same thing goes with with timing the market. You know, uh, William Sharp, the Nobel Prize winner, found that you had to be right about your market calls 82 percent of the time to match buying and holding. And that is a Big, big ask, especially when you think that every buy decision has a, a, a you know, a con commensurate sell decision and vice versa. Um, you have to figure out when to get out. You also have to figure out when to get back in. And I mean, let's just call it what it is. The market is completely irrational. And you see, you know, the, the market, I study this stuff. I've written three books about it. And the market still just defies all of my expectations again and again. You know, we're, we're seeing these unemployment numbers that are 10x historical highs 
and there's real suffering and the market's just on a complete tear. I mean, I just, you know, uh, the, the economy is not the market. The market is not always rational. And so the, the, the thing to do is, is usually nothing. Kevin is, uh, is, is talking about something in the comments that, uh, <laughs> that is a study that I saw too. I'm sure you saw this. You see this, the Fidelity study where they went through their retirement accounts and the best performers were the dead people? Yeah. So I wrote about that. I first read about that in Jim O'Shaughnessy's book, What Works on Wall Street. And I cited it in The Laws of Wealth. And the two best performing, according to Jim, the two best performing uh, uh, types of people were those who were dead or those who had forgotten about their accounts. And so, I mean, that's, I, I had a buddy call me up the other day and he's like, you know, he had read my book and he goes, I'm, I'm part of your book. He, ha he had forgotten to roll over some 401k 10 years ago or something. He hadn't touched it. And of course he had done fantastic and he had far outperformed what he had done with his real money, right? The money that he was watching and, you know, sort of actively, actively managing. So, yeah, I mean, if we could know the end from the beginning, there's absolutely you'd want to be very, very active. Uh, there's just nothing to suggest that we can do that. You know, one more study, uh, even the smartest people in the room, so-called, uh, you know, David Dreeman, the famous contrarian value investor, studied uh, consensus Wall Street analyst estimates and found that they were correct one time in 170. Oh, so, my. I mean, it's just like, so yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, you hear these stories about, oh, so-and-so, you know, Jim Bob, my neighbor was all in cash, you know, when coronavirus hit and he, you know, loaded the boat a couple of weeks ago and now he's got a, you know, got a beach house. So, I mean, it happens, right? Like it happens, people get lucky, uh, but I have, uh, I have almost no faith in people's ability to do this, uh, you know, bef before the fact. This is this is where I feel lucky that that I got to you know be in the industry for 16 years because I'll tell you Jim Bob probably did that and Jim Bob talks loudly about that but Jim Bob's not telling you the five things he messed up before that that completely <laughs> offset it like and that's every investor by the way that's everybody the only ones they talk about are the times that they hit it big right you go to vegas you talk about the time that you won at blackjack but you don't talk about the five hundred dollars before that that you flushed down the toilet before you won so in in my latest book the behavioral investor i, I looked at that very thing and, and let me quote the researchers that said that people's re, uh, that the that the alignment of reality and people's uh, recall of reality was quote indistinguishable from zero. So like people, <laughs> you know, people had no memory. And you know the other thing is people also confuse brains with a bull market. You know what the study also found was that people drastically underreported their losses, they drastically overreported their gains, and they drastically uh, overestimated what percentage of their gains were due to their own skill and not just a rising market. Like, yeah, you may have had great results the last 10 years, but guess what? So did your grandma. Like, I mean, you know, like everybody, everybody had good results the last 10 years. It's not because you're a, a, a hedge fund sleeper pick. Right. I remember, I think it was a Schwab study where they went back and I'm sure you've seen this also. So you, you'll correct me if it wasn't a Schwab study. They went back and they looked at uh, anonymously just things people sold and then the, what they bought with the proceeds and, and, and some phenomenal amount of the time. I don't remember the stat, but it was a huge number, s some huge number percentage of the time. The thing they bought with the proceeds performed worse later than the thing that they'd sold to buy it. So what's fascinating, I, I am familiar with that study, that also generalizes to professional money managers, which should really chasten people's uh, ability to think that they can do this. What they find is active managers, so like fund of funds, so funds who are made up of, of other funds. Like a target date thing? Uh, yeah, so like a, like a hedge fund of oh, funds. Oh, yeah, 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 sure, right. Managers, right? The managers that are fired go on to do better than the managers that that are are brought in right so it's like because again it's wall street bizarro world 
Uh, what we do as human beings, because we have lim limited cognitive capacity, is we tend to project the, the present moment into the future indefinitely. We think whatever's going on now is all that will ever go on. And what, you know, what I see all around me is all that will ever be. And in the midst of a quarantine like this, that's a harrowing thought, right? But the truth about life and about markets is not whatever is, is all that will ever be. The truth about markets is this too shall pass. We find that, you know, types of investing you know, say a strategy like value or growth, types of investing that have done well in the medium term, three to five years, tend to do poorly over the next three to five years. Markets that have been hot for four or five years tend to be cold for the next four or five years. And so it's, it's tricky because our wiring is 180 degrees opposite of what we should be doing. Yeah, it's funny. Whenever, when we tried to do rebalancing, uh, I would you know, sit with my client, let's say that it was 50% stock, 50% bonds. We'll just use a crappy allocation here. And, you know, like right now the stock market went down, bonds then look like a bigger percentage of the portfolio. Client walks in and I tell them, hey, th we're going to do this thing called, called rebalancing where we automatically buy low, sell high. Client gets it cerebrally, right? And then, and then, and then I say, and then they lean forward and go, okay, so how are we doing this? I said, well, we're going to take this fund and, and, and they don't think of it as the fund that's hot right now. They, they would generally say, oh, you mean the good one, the good one, yeah. the good one. Yeah. Okay. We're going to do something with it. What are we going to do with a good one? We're going to put more in that. No, we're going to sell some of it. What, why the hell are we going to do that? What are you, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, I just explained it and they go, okay, well, you, you've been a great advisor so far. What do you want to do with it? And I go, well, we're going to put it over here in the area that's down, that's going to revert to the mean, but, but they don't see it that way. It's, we're going to throw good money after bad money, right? Yep. <laughs> throw good money after bad. And we're buying the bad one. Why are we taking the good one and buying more of the bad one? Like I remember Bloomberg saying that asset allocation to your point takes guts of steel. They said like, that was their, that was their direct quote. I love that guts of steel to do asset allocation. Well, one of the things about asset allocating, uh, as, as smart as it is to be a multi-asset class investor, you know, my, my friend, Dr. Brian Portnoy has this great saying, and he says, you know, uh, asset alloc diversification means always having to say you're sorry, because something is always going to be underperforming, right? If everything's up at the same time, weirdly, you're not doing it right. Like, you know, you should not, you should effectively never have a time where everything's doing well. And that's a hard, that's a hard thing to grasp. It's you know? so hard. Yeah. Cause there will always be a bad one. There'll, sure. there'll always be a bad one. Uh, uh, John says something th that, that I wanted to point to. He said, not doing uh, much right now seems super duper hard. Why not put, put more in while the quote market is market is down. Do you like changing the strategy that way? Yeah, so John uh, John makes a, a great point. So a couple of things when I say um, when I say don't do anything, I mean don't panic and you know don't don't panic sell and freak out and liquidate your account. Uh, putting in what I call crash bets. So one of the things that I have here that I will not show you for compliance reasons is I have stocks that I like, uh, stocks that I like that I have wanted to own but I have thought of as too expensive historically. So I have limit orders in for a lot of this stuff so that you know when it gets cheap enough, when it gets attractive, then you go, you go grab it. So yeah, it, it is really hard to do nothing. So uh, I've been trying to encourage people to, you know, if you wanna rebalance, rebalance. If you wanna put in crash bids and do some of what John's talking about, I think that can certainly be sensible. You can even look for other outlets like, you know, my clients are financial advisors and I've been telling them, you know, John's right. Doing nothing is super duper hard. It goes against human nature. So instead of doing nothing, maybe look for a way to help in the fight against COVID-19, you know, develop a new exercise, a new home exercise routine, develop a meditation practice. So you can do things that are outside of the market and you can do things inside of the market this is what uh, shrinks like myself call replacement behaviors. So you're taking a bad behavior like freaking out and panic selling and replacing it with better behaviors because he's right. Like doing nothing is super duper hard. It's, it's, um, 
you know, I think back and we were talking about this on Wednesday when Scott Heiser was here with us talking about healthcare, that we weren't going to talk about what the government's doing about healthcare. We were going to stick with pot one, the stuff we can control. You're talking about focusing on the things that you can control, not the market controlling. Yeah. So chapter chapter one of the laws of uh, of the laws of wealth is all about controlling the controllable. It's called you control what matters most because when when most people hear what I do, they go, uh, well, what's the Fed going to do, or what's Trump going to do, or like what's happening in geopolitics, or like when will there be peace in the Middle East? Like it's always external factors. They're asking me about some external factor as it relates to the economy, as if that's the biggest predictor of whether or not they're going to be a successful investor. All the research says controlling the controllable is such a better predictor of whether or not you reach your financial goals. And so this is stuff like, you know, uh, allocating uh, asset allocation. This is stuff like managing fees. This is stuff like potentially working with an advisor if you feel you need that kind of help. You know, all these things are within your control and they matter a lot more than you timing the next coronavirus outbreak or something. It's it's funny you say that. I want to uh, uh, put Andrew's point up here because I like what Andrew says, and it's and, and it's interesting. He said to to your point about a financial advisor helping calm clients during stressful times. I think that's a question you need to ask yourself if you need for someone indexing and able to stay calm. It may not be necessary. And and, and what's funny, Andrew, before I get uh, uh, Dr. Crosby's take on this, my personal take has always been. I do not understand. I just, and, and, and by the way, and this is just me, I don't understand not wanting to surround myself with people who are not as emotional about my goals as I am and uh, and people that, that uh, are smarter than I am about this one particular topic. Like I enjoy being the least smart person on my team. And, and surrounding myself and, and, and maybe I'm overcoached. I mean, everybody around me will tell you that, that, that I'm always hiring coaches who will uh, help me get ahead. But then I look at what I've done and I, I've, I look at a lot of that is because I choose to surround myself with these, with these really smart people. And by the way, and I'm not a financial advisor, right? I mean, I know my co-host is, but, but, but me from a standpoint of not even being one anymore, I still like having very smart people around me, but, 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 but to Andrew's point, if you can hold the line right now, it might not be necessary. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to steal a framework from Morgan Housel, the great investment writer. Uh, so he says that uh, 10% of people do not need a financial advisor. Like 10% of people have nerves of steel they can make it through even the thorniest crisis. They just don't need it because they're that knowledgeable and they're that disciplined. Okay. He says 10% of people are degenerate gamblers, right? Like 10% of people, there's, there's, there's nobody that can help them. The best advisor on earth. Can't, Unsavable. Yeah. Can't save them from themselves. And then like there's the 80% in the middle. So part of it for me comes down to understanding what financial advisors do best because coming up with an appropriate asset allocation is quite easy, right? I mean, you could spend uh, you could spend a long weekend, uh, read a couple of books, read a couple articles, and come up with you know a, an asset allocation that you could do yourself. That's it's very very easy. Sticking with that through thirty years of bank crises and and pandemics and everything else is the hard part. So the biggest thing, the research is unequivocal that the biggest thing that an advisor does for their clients is from keeping them from making big, dumb decisions at times like this when people are really panicked. So if you can do it, uh, if you don't need that, then you may not need an advisor. But my, my final caveat would be, though, the more self-assured you are that you don't need it, it may weirdly be a sign that you're overconfident, right? Like I feel like people, you know, people who are so cocksure about this, like, oh, I've got it, I don't need an advisor, you know, sometimes might actually, because their their thought that they don't need it, it's, a, it's actually a symptom of overconfidence. So yeah, I, I'm sort of of the mind that maybe 10% of people don't need an advisor, uh, but the 10, but but the people who are sure that they don't might, because they might be overconfident. Yeah. 
Uh, Susan has a has a point. She says she she finally broke down and looked at her accounts last night, first time since February. This was after my financial advisor called to see how I was doing and said clients were pleasantly surprised. The part of, of what Susan's talking about that I'd like to talk about this idea of not looking at it right. Um, uh, I don't. Did, did you prefer not to look at it, not to look at the market, or look at it and just not move? So I tear my statements up. So I, I tear my statements up because Susan, who is glad she didn't look a couple of weeks ago, right? Susan, Susan, who had a better night looking last night than, than three weeks ago. Um, the, the reason I tear my statements up is because I've got 25 years to retirement. And I know that the more you look, uh, the, the dicier it gets. So if you look at the market on any given day, right? any given day, the market's up about 55% of the time and down about 45% of the time. But we also know that human behavior is such that losses loom larger in our head than gains do. So we know that we are two and a half times as upset about a loss as we are excited about a comparably sized gain. And so while the market's down about half of the time, it feels emotionally like it's down all the time. Now, the further you can stretch that out, you know, at the extreme, if you only looked at your uh, portfolio once a decade, it would almost never be down, right? There's only been one or two times in a hundred years where it would have been down if you could muster that kind of self-control, but it goes out from there. The less frequently you look at it, the, the better your odds of it being positive. And so I, I tear my statements up and I, I consider it an occupational hazard that I even have to give a dang about what the market's doing, right? Like I, I sort of have to stay abreast of what's going on just for stuff like this and just for my job, but I would be a better investor if I didn't have to tune into some of this stuff. And I have someone managing my money, right? I have someone managing my money because I know that even though I study this, even though I've written books about it, I'm just as dumb as the next guy when it comes to making irrational decisions with my money. So I have someone who's there basically to slap my hand when I try and do something dumb. Uh, uh, well, the other thing you can do, I like uh, PFLYER 12's approach. Every time I think about checking my accounts, I walk to the fridge for another drink. <laughs> uh, P flyer. I'm not believing the JK buddy. I'm, I'm believing <laughs> there's a little, I'm believing there's a little uh, truth in that humor. I'm mad at you. Yeah. P flyer 12 on the way to a, another drink. And then when this is over the 12 step program, so <laughs> there, yeah. there, there you go. Probably, hopefully not. Right. Uh, 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 Bill says I've been putting more in during the crash. The hardest part's just deciding how much of my cash buffer I want to I want to leave intact. It seems like it'd be a, that'd be an equally dangerous thing, wouldn't it? To go into your cash reserve, your emergency fund and start investing that, 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 that could start, can start feeling like betting. So I will, I will say people, some people think this is kind of pie in the sky. I personally like to keep six months cash, like six months cash expenses. And I think it's, it's more important than ever I think, I think most experts would have you somewhere between three and six months. I try and err on the side of six months because uh, the higher up the corporate ladder you climb, the harder it becomes to find a job in some senses. You know, sort of the, the general rule of thumb is uh, one month of job searching for every $10,000 you want to make. And so if you're making, you know, if you're a professional that's making six figures, it, it could take a minute to find a job. And I mean, I think at a time when we're seeing five and six million new unemployed every week, which doesn't begin to account, by the way, for the for those who are furloughed, for, yeah. solo, for, for solopreneurs who are in a lot of pain. Like, I mean, I think our job numbers are, are not at all as, as bad as they are. I don't think they're at all indicative of, of how bad it really is. So I'm I'm all on board for buying low, but I, I would just caution people that uh, a savings, uh, an emergency rainy day fund has probably never been more important in American history than it is right now. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. 
in the monster downturns that 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 I was through, and certainly not the same thing, right? Every time is different. But 2000 to 2002, 2007, 2008, the idea of buying the dip got you smoked. Just 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 especially over the short term, because you thought you were buying low, and the market just found a way to go lower. I remember, you know, I was fairly young in my career during the 2000 2002 downturn, and I remember that whole first year, uh, Daniel, just buying and buying and buying, and it just it turned into less and less and less money. Um, but I was going whole hog where now I think an idea of, you, you know, I cut out my wine subscription as an example. I had this, I had this silly wine subscription, uh, cause we'd have people over, we'd go to parties and I would just grab a bottle from that. And it was always good stuff. And I didn't have to go to the store. I cut that out and I added that to my automatic investment. So now every month I'm buying and I have no short term illusion that that's, you know, buying the dip. Um, I'm not going all in instead. I'm prepared to write out the whole thing. Cause, cause it, I mean, it, it could be dangerous, I think. So if you look at, um, if you look at history, the, the biggest days in history have all been in the worst markets, right? And so, uh, in 2000, 2001, we had three, we had three 20% plus rallies before the market bottomed. In 08, 09, you had two 20% different 20% plus rallies before the market eventually bottomed. I have no idea what's going to happen here. So yeah. let me say that I have no idea if we found a bottom and we're on our way up or if this is a head fake. I have no idea. But uh, there's two things to consider. First of all, keep that cash reserve. And second of all, it's all about time frame. I mean, if you're, uh, if you're, if you don't need this money for 30 years, Bill, Bill looks like a, a young gentleman. Like if you don't need this money for 30 years, you're fine. Like, I mean, you know, there's, there's almost no, uh, th there's almost no thought that, that whatever you do right now is going to be problematic. But if you think you have found the true bottom and that's sort of your goal, I think you have to be, you have to be very careful. Yeah. Susan says, uh, her emergency fund has an emergency fund. <laughs> That's good. Susan. I love it. <laughs> Susan, someone, someone tentative, someone tentative and safe after my own heart. I love it. Gigi makes a, an interesting point. She says, uh, JL Collins, I think you're familiar with him. Yeah. One spoke about using bonds at this time to sell and then buy up stocks that have gone uh, down, like the uh, total stock market index. Would this be something to consider? Yeah, I can't, I can't comment on any sort of specific tactics. But I would, you know, I would just reinforce like anything, any, uh, all the stuff that we've talked about before. We talked about rebalancing, right? I mean, that's effectively what, what you're saying there. Just, just keeping it in check. Whatever your appropriate asset allocation is, I think the volatility that we've seen in the last little bit would means that many people are going to have to rebalance soon to keep uh, within their risk tolerance. So whatever that looks like for you, I think that's a sound policy, but I wouldn't, I couldn't comment on the specifics. Uh, uh, I will. Uh, <laughs> I, I got a jobby job. <laughs> uh, uh, the the thing that that does, Gigi, is that changes your standard deviation. I mean, to put it very uh, nerdy, but what that means is that you have to expect that you're going to go from this type of a wiggle in your portfolio because the bonds are making it historically uh, wiggle less. As you sell those bonds, your portfolio is going to start having much, much bigger swings. So, it, but, but part of my issue is, is w w what return do you need to get to your goal? Number one, and um, do you need those type of swings to get to your goal? And then, and then behaviorally, can you stand these swings? Right? Even if you need that high return to reach your goal, will you? You know, Susan was talking about sleep at night. Will you sleep at night? with that. So I think people don't don't realize that you're changing the inherent risk profile of the entire portfolio when you put a lot of, you know, pepper in the chili or whatever the analogy is we want to use. Yeah, to you know, to your point, you know, I wrote a book called Personal Benchmark that's all about having these goals and and coming up with an investment plan that's personalized to your benchmark. So you're not trying to maximize returns like in a vacuum. You're trying to maximize anxiety-adjusted return. Like, yeah. what's the return I need 
to, to reach my goal in such a way that I can sleep well at night and don't take one, uh, one bit more risk than, than that. Melissa, who's across town for me. Hey, Melissa, uh, uh, why don't financial experts ever plan to retire early? Do you plan to retire early? Uh, me? I, so I plan to shift. I will probably, I'll never retire, retire, yeah. but I would like to, there's things I'd like to do less of. Like I'd like to try, I have young children. I'd like to travel less. So I have my, my whole career has been a, a gradual process of, of traveling less uh, and doing less stuff that I don't like. And I would like the don't stuff I don't like uh, meter to go to near zero, but I'll never stop working because uh, we don't retire because it's so much fun. Right. Well, that's what I was, you know, Cheryl and I, Melissa, were talking about this same thing and uh, she loves what she does, but, uh, but she said, you know, maybe, maybe 10 years from now, she'll, she'll stop doing that. And then she turned to me and started laughing. And I said, what's so funny? She's like, I want to die with this microphone <laughs> right in front of me. And by the way, it'd scare the hell up for everybody else on the YouTube video. You guys all watching me die. But for me, for me, that would be, that'd be what I want to do. I can't imagine not doing this. Like it, it's, it's the most fun thing I could ever do. But you look at a lot of the top people, maybe not on Wall Street, uh, Daniel, where it's, you know, high pressure all the time, but you look at a lot of career fields. I think people don't have early retirement aspirations because they're in the thing that they truly enjoy. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a big part of it. Uh, I think, you know, uh, for, for me personally, one thing I want to do uh, more in the coming years is do more writing. Like I, I think I will never stop writing, you know, writing for me is perhaps like the, the mic is for you and writing pays abysmally. Like I would, you know, I, but I would like <laughs> would like the luxury to be able to write and make very, very terrible money all day. And so it's not retirement per se. It's just me doing, you know, me making career decisions independent of a paycheck. That's sort of, I think, what, what many of us are, are looking for, not, not retirement per se. I, would, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. Yeah. Yeah. J just do the thing that doesn't pay very well. Sure. I just want to do impractical things. The psychology major wants to do impractical things. What do you know? That's strange. Who I knew? Know. That's weird. <laughs> That's a shock. Uh, 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 Bill says, um, uh, along with this taxable account, continuing to invest. Wow, he's putting money into all the all the the IRA, uh, IRS codes. That's 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 fun. Um, Can I borrow some money? <laughs> to be Schley says, uh, heard you speaking about Ginny May funds. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, Daniel is talking to me, or he or she is talking to me here, thinking about placing a vacation fund that we use for overseas travel about every four years. Currently money in, is in a high yield savings, $10,000, usually a trip. Your thoughts, you have any, you have any thoughts in general about Ginny Mays or no? Don't know a thing about it. Yeah. Uh, uh so historically, uh, uh, 2B, I'm just going to call you 2B, uh, historically, Ginny Mays are, are great for that time frame. J just remember that there's no FDIC insurance. You can lose money. Um, future future returns have, you know, the, the whole thing about the, the past doesn't equal the future. But if you go back historically and look at a couple things about what you're doing, this is low income housing. You're putting money into this government agency, not by the way, a part of the government. It's a government sponsored agency. So that gives you the little kick that I was talking about on the show where it's worked for me. Fantastic. If I've got a four or five year goal, I like it. Just remember, there will be times in Ginny Mays that you will lose money. Um, uh, it, it, it is not a principal guaranteed. If you really, really, really want to be safe, I'd stick with your high yield savings account. Um, however, over most four year time frames historically, your Ginny May fund would have won when it came to, to, to return. So there's a risk reward thing going on there. Um, so I can't advocate it either, but I think I can tell you what the risk profile would be. Uh, uh, Colin says, uh, likes, uh, likes his, his, his Ginny Mays, uh, a uh, question about your books. Are your books on audible? Yes, John, they are. And if you buy them, my children will get $3 to eat. So thank you. <laughs> 
that, that that does pay well. That that pays way better than I thought. Uh, when you said it doesn't pay well, I thought it like a buck fifty, but three dollars. Please, sir, uh, the children. Yes, um, yeah. So, but here, do do the math. I think I think to um, I think to uh, to make the New York Times bestseller list, you need to sell about twelve or thirteen thousand books in a shortish amount of time. So if, so if you're a New York Times bestselling author and you have a good royalty deal like I do, you make 30 grand. <laughs> so, so it's not, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not nothing, but it's, uh, it's, you know, nobody's, nobody's buying a beach house unless you write Harry Potter. So, but it's, it could, could you write Harry Potter asset allocates? Yeah. Or- Behavioral finance is not a Harry Potter type <laughs> seller. So, uh, yeah, they're on audible though. Harry Potter and the diversified portfolio. Yeah, like Harry the, Potter and the Gen uh, right. <laughs> and not being paid of a future returns. Yeah. Right. I mean, imagine the real estate in that book. If he just bought up Hogwarts with all that, that's a, that's a own a castle. Right. It's like big Airbnb there. That's mm-hmm. fantastic. Right. Uh, anybody just just coming on right now is wondering what the hell we're actually talking about. Hey, uh, 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 of your books, by the way. Now that you have a few books under your belt, if somebody wants the best introduction, if somebody's on on introduction territory to your work, which one's the best place to start? Because I was wondering that today, having read read three of your books. Yeah. Um, wh- well, where's the best place to start? The Laws of Wealth, for sure. The Laws of Wealth is is by far the sort of the most accessible for a retail audience. Yeah, uh, 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 Kevin, if you buy individual Ginny Mays guaranteed by the government, the, the answer that's no, a Ginny May is backed by the faith and trust of the government, uh, but it is a government agency, meaning the agency, the agent, the, 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 the agencies, there's an implicit trust with a Ginny May, not an explicit trust. So, uh, there's a fine line there. That's why you get historically a little bump up from a treasury with a Ginny May. I didn't know this was going to be in the Ginny May show. I have a question for Kevin about that milkshake. It looks incredible. I know that's what that's what I want to know. What, what exactly is in that? And what's this milkshake? I went to, by the way, I was um uh, I'm gonna get the name of the burger place wrong. Fantastic burger place, of course, in Texas, where there's phenomenal hamburgers. But the um, but I had this milkshake that had bacon in it. And 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 when I ordered it, it had bananas and caramel. And I was on board. I didn't see the bacon until after I got it. Bacon in a milkshake, by the way, incredibly disgusting. Don't do it. Do do not do it. Yeah, the bacon, the bacon thing jumped the shark. I think in 2015 ish. Like, I mean, bacon's incredible. I don't want to be sacrilegious here, but like the putting bacon in everything. I don't know. I can't. Yeah, too much. And Travis makes a good point. Harry had a ton of gold in that first movie. Remember that? (laughs) What do you think, by the way? Let's turn this into a serious discussion because uh, uh, I've ranted 500 times about people that load up on commodities, right? Um, But your thoughts on commodities and, uh, and, and because behaviorally, that's where people flee, right? Behaviorally, people flee to commodities. People flee to treasuries. Yeah. So again, can't can't uh, agree or disagree. You know, can't you know give any sort of specific advice? But the thing I would say is, any kind of commodity fund is going to be oil heavy right now. And so your your thesis on commodities and your thesis on oil should be uh, sort of interlocked. So if if you think oil is coming back, uh, go nuts. If you don't, you might want to be careful because uh, all the commodity ETFs I've looked at are very, very, uh, energy heavy. Well, and I, and I look at just gold as an example. I'm always told in times like now that people don't like the risk of the stock market. So they decided to move their money to gold. And historically, according to Walter Updegrave, um, great writer, uh, eight times more volatile than the stock market. So the thing about gold, uh, the thing about gold for me is, Gold to me is like a hedge against the zombie apocalypse. Like gold is like, you know, you you buy physical gold if you think the 
the pillars of society are falling and we're going to be trading cigarettes and bullets. Like, I don't know. <laughs> but, so like buying, so if you are, if you are super scared about just, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of civil society falling apart, then maybe physical gold makes sense or physical silver. But, but, you know, buying, buying paper gold, you know, buying gold in, uh, in sort of financial instrument form has always seemed to to sort of miss the point to me. So we'll see. Yeah, I, I, I don't get it. Hey, Lenny's here with us. Lenny, I was thinking about you the other day. I, I think Lenny's in the New York area. Just always, always thinking about our New York area listeners, especially uh, 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 during th this stuff. Hope you're staying safe. Lenny says, speaking of gray shakes, the heart attack grill in Vegas puts a stick of butter <laughs> in your milkshake. The, I watched the thing on the heart attack grill. It was like, it was like a spite store. Like the guy started it. It was, he had a fitness thing. He had like fitness videos. He was like a fitness guru and his fitness thing didn't take off. And so he's like, fine, I'm going the other way. Like you guys want to be a bunch of fat slobs, like come be fat slobs at my place. And then he started putting a stick of butter and milkshakes. I, I I recall walking by that place the last time I was in Vegas and it just looks so, so horrible. Just, just un, unbelievable. I, yep. Lenny is in, in New York city. Glad you're glad you're healthy, Lenny. And things are, things are okay there. Steve asked about inflation rates over the next 10 to, to, to 20, 20, uh, 10, 20 years with a $25 trillion deficit. Uh, I think that's more of an economics question than the behavioral guys question, isn't it? Yeah, so I will approach it from a behavioral perspective, <clears throat> which is to say, uh, coming out of uh, coming out of the great financial crisis, people had the same questions about, uh, you know, we're, we're we're printing money, you know, there's all this stimulus, what's going to happen to inflation, and and nothing happened to inflation. And so I'm not saying nothing will happen to inflation over the next 10, 20 years uh, as a result of, of what we're seeing going on. All I'm saying from a behavioral perspective is it's really hard to predict the future. Like it's, it's really, really hard to predict the future. Some of the smartest people in the room thought we would have massive inflation from, from 08 to present, and it just never materialized because there's also a lot of really deflationary forces uh, out there as well. So uh, it's not, I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea, but I think that the caveat there is it's very, very hard to predict stuff like this. And it's a complex dynamic system, right? You've got big deficits, you've got big Fed stimulus, but you've also got things like the internet, which are a massive deflationary force. And so uh, I don't know how it shakes out, but just be careful about taking big bets, I think. We were uh, on our walk uh, yesterday just to get the heck out of the house. My spouse and I were talking about this, that very same thing yesterday. Like, what happens next? We have, you've, you've, we're in unprecedented territory there. Yeah. We have, we have no idea. And in, in fact, it's funny. I saw that. Did you see the video of the woman? The woman, the video takes place in January of this year, and it's a woman from the future right now going back to tell herself about it. Did you see that video? Oh, but you need to send it to me. Oh, it's fantastic. The, the, the woman, the woman, uh, the, the, the woman in January says, says, man, I'm worried about these wildfires in, in Australia. I think that's how 2020 is going to be defined. And the, the person, the person from right now, you know, the herself four months later is just laughing in her face. Like I forgot those even existed. Not that they weren't bad, but. Well, to to make a to make a secondary point on this not only do you have to predict the event correctly you then have to pre predict the market reaction correctly i mean yeah. on, on the day uh you know the, the, sort of the the wall street logic is that markets hate uncertainty you know the day that donald trump got elected so the evening right the futures were gutted like i mean it was a complete bl bloodbath the day that trump got elected and since then, until you know, just recently, the market's done nothing but but go up. So if you ask the forecasters, you know, would Trump get elected? First of all, almost everyone said no. And then if if you thought Trump was going to get elected, the popular opinion was, well, the market will crash because it will hate uncertainty. That's not what happened. You know, you look at what happened. Let's say you called these massive jobless numbers, the degree of joblessness that we've seen. 
uh, over the last three weeks. Nobody called it effectively, right? But even if you did call it, do you think we would get 22 million unemployed people and the market would rally like crazy? Like, I mean, you know, so predicting the future is hard enough. Predicting how markets will react to the future is a whole nother level of crazy, uh, which is where I think you, it just comes down to stuff like diversification and staying the course. It's 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 uh, it's crazy. I just looked while you were talking to see what the market's even doing today. Up four hundred right now. Yeah. For, for what? I like what my I like what my co-host OG says. The market finds a way to disappoint the largest number of people at all times. And I think if you just keep that in mind, that uh, probably you're going to have a little bit better behavior. Yeah, yeah. The market's excited about an experimental drug today, so that's what it's doing. Uh, 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 John has a question for me. Does Dr. Crosby's summary of a gold buying doomsday to accurately describe our contributor, Len Penzo? Yes, it does. Absolutely. Len has a, uh, Len has a bunker deep under Los Angeles and he's eating MREs right now. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, uh, Tubi says, can't wait till this is over safe and healthy social, social isolation lifted and Joe can get the DJ business back up and running. That's a blast from the past, man. That was a long, long time ago. I, 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 I still, I, I've got to tell you this, um, on a Friday night, I still sometimes get goosebumps that I don't have to go to work. I still do. I'm 52 years old and I haven't been a disc jockey since I was maybe 25. And, um, and I get goosebumps that it's Friday night and I don't have to go to work because that, that uh, that period of my life was just every weekend come home smelling like beer because beer's been poured all over all my equipment. What was, your, what was your go-to slow jam? Oh, it depended on the year because it was an eight-year run. But, um, but uh, you know, and it also depended on the gig. So if it was a wedding reception, I like going, going to the 50s, like the really old stuff. Like uh, the platters, only you sure. was a was a fantastic, fantastic song um, for for a um, for a college party back in the early nineties. Oh, uh, 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 Roxy Music, um, um, more than this. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, oh my goodness! But you've got guitars, so but, but so you actually play something. I was a DJ because I can't play anything. Yeah, no, I mean I'm from Alabama, so you got to play a little bit, right? Like you, they don't even let you grow up there unless you play a little bit. So I just play enough to pass for a kid from Alabama, but that's that's as good as I am. <laughs> Uh, uh, we're going to take, uh, last questions now, guys. So if you guys have a last question and while we're waiting on somebody who maybe wants to finish this off, I'm going to talk one more time about next week. So on Monday, um, negotiating is a big part of, uh, of, of life of success. Uh, you're negotiating all the time. And, uh, Maury Teherapur, who is a, uh, uh, Wharton professor, Fantastic book here, Bring Yourself, How to Harness the Power of Connection and Negotiate Fearlessly. We're going to talk about the, the some of the, the key points in negotiating, which, by the way, is a lot different than you'll hear from like a Chris Voss as an example. I love the fact that you can negotiate um, and, 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 and bring yourself. And, and kind of the 30,000 foot view is that you, you don't have to be a hard ass to negotiate. Uh, be who you are. If you try to be somebody other than you are, she believes, and she has worked with some big companies in negotiations, uh, that, um, that you're going to negotiate much, much better. And then, and then on Wednesday, uh, uh, Chris Kermitzos, one of my favorite business people. I know a lot of you are sitting at home thinking about starting a business. And one thing I wish I had done what with this, with our podcast was to start earlier than we did. Uh, and, Chris Kermitzos. And well, and, and you know, the reason we didn't, we didn't start early because of the fact that I thought we were going to suck. So here's what happened. We waited a year and we still sucked. So Chris is, has a great message about just getting out there and starting ugly. And if you, if you need a kick in the pants next Wednesday show, will be, will be that. 
All right, we've got we've got a couple of uh, of things. By the way, if you guys uh, uh, if you're on YouTube and you want to make sure you get these, if you can't hang out with us and you want to see them later, uh, hit the subscribe button ahead, and then that'll make sure that you'll see them right even later. So if you can't catch up with us next Wednesday, we're gonna have Tracy McCubbin, one of my favorite declutter experts. Who Dr. Crosby doesn't want to declutter something right now? Even me, I never want to declutter stuff. And I look around here and I'm like, man, I think I got to go into my clothes closet and do some decluttering. I don't know, man. I think maybe Marie Kondo's upset about some of that stuff she threw away. She could have been playing with you. Know, you could have you could need it. You need it, you know? No, I, it's like, it's it's been fascinating to watch the, these like deep-seated impulses that are within of all of us. It's like, I got to complete like, I have an urge to clean everything. Like I got to clean the garage. I got to make bread. I don't know why. It's just like I need, right. <laughs> I need carbs for days and I need to clean everything. Yeah. It's, I have seen so many people making bread. It, oh. is, it is, it is true. Making bread is a real thing now. I made, I made a sourdough starter. I nurtured wild yeast for seven days <laughs> to make sourdough bread. Who am I? I don't even know. <laughs> Maybe that's your side hobby right that's there. Side hustle. That's what's coming out of this whole thing. Phil joins us and says, is it common knowledge that the 401k max amounts based on your contribution, not including the match? Uh, once again, not, not, not great behavioral stuff, but, 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 uh, but I do think it. Let me read this again. Is it common knowledge for K Max Boss based on your kind of reason, not including the match? I don't. I don't know that it is. the The answer The answer to that to widen that Philip is 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 is, is, is much bigger. There are three hundred thirty million people in the United States. We have one of the biggest in in class uh, or a podcast in the investing subcategory of iTunes and uh, 140,000 people, according to PodTrack, know who we are. It, none of this is common knowledge to anybody. Like the difference between our audience and the number of people out there is this huge gulf. So the answer is none of this stuff is common knowledge. We are the sub, sub, subset of nerds that pay attention to this stuff, right? You and, 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 and the, the what 50 of us hanging out here. So question for Philip, Philip, is it common knowledge that the Red Sox broke my freaking heart when they swept the Cardinals in the world series? Is that common knowledge, Philip? It, it is now still hurts. Philip. I was going to say, you still seem a little, a, a little bitter. John wants to know if you've got any, uh, college allegiance there in from Alabama, one or the other, I would think. Uh, War Eagle, John, because I went to, uh, I went to BYU and Emory because I was one of the seven Mormons in Alabama. So I did not go to either of the, of the Alabama schools, but my grandparents went to Auburn before it was, uh, before it was Auburn, when it was Alabama polytechnic, whatever. Uh, and my sister went to Auburn, so I'm a, I'm a big Auburn fan. Yeah, again, you you got to choose sides, and and I choose to be the little sister. I, I like that. The seven of you, you yeah. guys have like a, you guys have a like a Facebook group. Seven of us. <laughs> Old Tim and Jane. Yep. <laughs> Didn't go to either school, but I love Auburn. Uh, uh, uh Bill says. Uh, 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 okay. Bill, Bill's answering the question. All right. Uh, Melissa's wearing all of her t-shirts, every single one of them. Uh, uh, Philip was making sourdough before it was cool. And, uh, yeah, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. All right, guys. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, thanks for hanging out with us again, Dr. Crosby. Thanks a ton for hanging out with us. People can find your books everywhere. Yeah, on the worldwide on Amazon. Yes, and if they want to uh, say hi to you on Twitter, you're always fun to follow on Twitter. Yeah, le le less and less fun. I'm getting more boring in my old age. But yeah, at Daniel Crosby, at Daniel Crosby on Twitter. Also, super active on LinkedIn, Daniel Crosby PhD. 
Yeah. Good, good guy to follow. Uh, always sharing, by the way, uh, the studies that we talked about today, you're always sharing a lot of that stuff, which is super interesting. I, I learn a ton just following you on social media. All right, guys. Uh, uh, join us Monday, Maury Taharapur. And, uh, we got a fun show out today with Andy Hill and, uh, Devin, um, Devin Watson from, uh, from, um, uh, Diebold Nixdorf. I always have trouble saying that Diebold Nixdorf, but anyway. All right, guys, have a great weekend. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.